Hey everyone, welcome to Virtual Asia Crypt 2020. My name is Thomas de Cru, and I'll be presenting our paper called Radicalized Agenies, which is joint work with Wouter Kastriek and Frederik Verkouteren. I'll start with a brief introduction to give a sketch of the general framework that we're dealing with. We'll be working with elliptic curves E over some finite field FQ. And we'll be computing isogenies between elliptic curves of this kind. Now for our purposes, one of the most important properties of an isogeny is simply that it has a degree. And the degree of an isogeny is a degree as a morphism. Now isogenies of large degree are typically hard to compute, unless they also have a smooth degree, in which case they can be written as the concatenation of isogenies of small degree, and hence they are easier to compute. Now we'll be only dealing with cyclic separable isogenies, which means they can be identified by a point that generates the kernel. So during this talk we'll interchangeably use the terms isogeny or kernel generator or point that generates the kernel and so on. Now in isogeny-based cryptography there's a general hard problem as follows. Given two elliptic curves, E and E prime, find an isogeny between them. Now this is a very general problem and there are many specific instantiations of this problem. However, given the correct setting and parameters, this is assumed to be very hard. Now in the seaside setting we use super singular elliptic curves over the prime field fp where p has a very specific form more precisely it's four times the bunch of small primes minus one and furthermore all the elliptic curves have this endomorphism ring now one of the reasons we use this setting is that it allows the easy computation of isogenies of degree l1 up until lr more precisely every prime li has two easy to compute isogenies corresponding to the action of a specific ideal in the class group. If you don't know what this means exactly, it doesn't matter much, just remember that for every prime Li there are two isogenies that are easy to compute and they are each other's inverses in the following sense. If you would start from an elliptic curve and compute an isogeny of degree Li of the first type, immediately concatenated by an isogeny of the second type, you would end up at the elliptic curve E again. Now for Seaside, the lowest security parameters are Seaside 512, and there we have R equals 74, which means we have 74 distinct prime degrees ranging from 3 to 587. And for each of these primes, Li, we will compute up to 5 isogenies. And this then corresponds to an isogen this isogeny then corresponds to the action of this ideal in the class group, where all the exponents E1 up until E74 are integers sampled from this interval. Now there are many ways to compute isogenies in general, however I've already mentioned that they are easy to compute in the seaside setting, and typically the straightforward or trivial approach is as follows. We will just have a point P as a kernel generator and then apply a Villus formula. A small remark here that we silently assume that the exponents EI are larger than zero, However, a very similar argument can be made if the exponents are negative. Now, Villus' formula are actually quite easy. We scale asymptotically with L, which is typically a small integer, so it's not too bad. However, we need a rational L torsion point uh, to actually apply the formulas or to compute them. And how do we find that? Well, the amount of points on this curve over FP is P plus one, which means if you take a random point, do scalar multiplication with p plus 1, uh, then you'll always end up at 0. So if you take a random point q and you multiply it with p plus 1 over l, then you end up with a point p that when you multiply this by l, you end up at 0. So this is an l torsion point. The only problem is you still have a probability of 1 over l that it's a trivial l torsion point. In that case you sort of need to start over, because otherwise you have a trivial isogeny and the kernel generates is simply the trivial kernel. However, in the seaside setting, they do it a lot smarter, more precisely, they push points through isogenies. So instead of generating a rational L torsion point, they generate a point of order dividing L1 times L2 times and so on up until LR. Next, they compute an isogeny of degree L1, followed by an isogeny of degree L2, and so on, as follows. And every step i, they only need to multiply the corresponding point by a small cofactor, and then you get a point of order Li. Next, they compute the isogeny, again with Villus formula, 
rather straightforward, but they also compute the image of Ri minus 1 under the isogeny. That means on the isogenous curve, they already have a point uh, of order Li plus 1 times and so on up until Lr. This computation actually saves a lot uh, of arithmetic, simply because we need to uh, compute uh, scalar multiplication with a lot smaller cofactor every time. However, this doesn't really get rid of the chance of failure. At every step along the way, you still have a probability of 1 over Li that uh, you end up at a point 0, and then you need to start over again, for that prime at least, which is a bit unfortunate. For that reason, we suggest an alternative, alternative approach with radical isogenies. Instead of computing an isogeny of L1 followed uh, of degree L1 followed by an isogeny of degree L2 and so on, we want to compute a chain of n isogenies. So we want to fix one of the Li and then compute an isogeny of degree Li to the power k. And we will do this as follows. Let's say we start from an elliptic curve E. We already have given some kernel generator P uh, determining an isogeny to a an elliptic curve E prime, and then we will derive explicit formulas for point P prime on E prime, such that it gives rise to another isogeny of degree n, which furthermore does not backtrack. What do I mean by that? I mean that this uh, next curve, E prime, quotient it out with uh, uh, subgroup generated by P prime, is not equal to E. So we do not have uh, the dual isogeny. We did not just compute the dual isogeny. Small remark though, that in general our p prime will not be defined over k. However, in the seaside setting that will be the case. Now the good thing is, this does not backtrack, so this is a cyclic isogeny, it's degree n squared. However, this also implies that we can keep doing this. We can go to n cube, n to the fourth power, and so on, and we can just repeat it until we have a degree n to the power k isogeny. And how will we do this? with something called radical isogenies, and it's a three-step approach. First, we'll find a general curve model with a point of order n. This is the Tate normal form, and we'll use Velu's formula to give the equation for the isogenous curve. The second step is the main contribution of our work. We'll find the field of definition for a point p prime on e prime that has order n as well. For this, we'll need the Tate pairing, and we'll also need simple radical extensions. In the third step, when we have the field of definition of p prime, we still need to determine the coordinates. And for this, we'll use the division polynomials. So step one is a Tate normal form. Every curve E, with a point p of order at least four, can be written in an isomorphic form, which looks like this, and where p is simply translated to the point zero, zero. We want the discriminant to be non-zero, and we also need n to be at least four. Now, if n is 2 or 3, you can make a very similar argument, just not with the Tate normal form. If you want to read the details of the cases n equal 2 or 3, uh, they are in our paper as well. Now, there's a unique form of this. However, for a given n, we can still derive a relation such that p has exact order n. Now, how do you do this? You can simply symbolically compute 2p, 3p, or minus p, minus 2p, and then say it has to have exact order n. So for example, if n is 5, just say 5 times p equals 0. Or simply, alternatively, 3 times p equals minus 2p, which saves a lot of computations. If you actually would write this out, you can probably still do this by hand. By the way, you would find that the relation for uh, n equals 5 is simply c minus b, which has to be 0. So you can just, for every time, for every occurrence of the parameter c, you can write b in this equation, and then the point p, 0, 0, has order 5 exactly. Now with this in mind, you can apply velu with kernel generator p, and then we end up on e prime, on this elliptic curve. So now we already have the isogenous curve, and next we want to find a point of order exactly 5 on this isogenous curve. In order to do this, we'll use the Tate pairing as mentioned earlier. Now the Tate pairing, as the name suggests, is a pairing, so it's a bilinear map of which, of which you can see the domain here. 
Now, the exact definition is not that important. The only two things that are important for us is that, first of all, it's easy to compute. It's pretty similar in complexity to scalar multiplication. And the codomain is the following coset. In particular, note that uh, Tate pairing is only defined up to nth powers. We also need the notion of simple radical extension. Now, this is the exact definition, but in words, uh, simple radical extension uh, is just taking the ground field and then adding an nth root of an element in that ground field. All right, with that in mind, we can formulate the main theorem of our paper. Recall that we wanted to find a point P prime on E prime, such that it has exact order n and uh, can be concatenated to a degree n squared isogeny. We can find such a point P prime always in a field extension where you just simply add an nth root of the Tate pairing of P with minus P. So all these, so you can always find a point P prime in a simple radical extension of degree n and you can easily compute which radical extension it has to be as well. Why did we have to choose the Tate pairing of P with minus P? We didn't have to, you can also take the Tate pairing of P with itself. However, if you take the Tate pairing of P with minus P, it's slightly easier to work with. Okay, we'll not give the proof, but we'll uh, continue the example of n equals five. For n equals five, the Tate pairing is simply B in the parameter of the Tate normal form. So P prime is defined over the base field where you join a fifth root of B. All right, so now that we have the field of definition, we still need to find the coordinates of P prime. And for this, we'll use the n division polynomials psi E prime n. These polynomials for every n are recursively defined and in a sense, easy to compute. However, as they grow larger with uh, larger n, it can become a bit of a bottleneck as well, which I'll expand upon in a bit. Their main property is that they vanish exactly at those points that are n-torsion. And we're looking for a point of that type. So we're looking for a p prime over this field, which is a root of this polynomial. Now note that you may wonder, why do you not find the roots of this polynomial immediately? Why do you need the field of definition? Because finding the field of definition is highly non-trivial. In general, as soon as you have a degree 5 polynomial or higher, no radical expressions in general exist anymore to find roots of that polynomial. Okay, let's take a look at the example for n equals 5. This is a factorization over the, of the 5 division polynomial over the general field, where we have not yet adjoined uh, the fifth root of b. So it factors as a quadratic piece and two quintic pieces. This quadratic piece we're not really interested in for the following. The roots of this are the x-coordinates that generate the dual isogeny. Recall that I said we wanted to go from e to e prime to a new curve. However, if we would use one of these roots as the x-coordinate of a kernel generator, you would end up at e again. Now, which one of the other two do we want to find a root for? It's pretty simple. It doesn't matter. They both will have a proper root over this for the following reason. Let's say we find a root here over the field that we know where it should have a root in. Then this will determine the x-coordinate of some point p prime. And since uh, it's a five torsion point also of the point minus p prime. And if we define this as p prime, then the next quintic factor will simply have the x-coordinate of two times p prime and hence also minus two times p prime. However, these points generate the same kernel, since n equals 5. So it doesn't really matter which one we take, you can just pick one and stick to that. Alright, let's say we want to take a look at the first quintic factor. If we uh, try and find the root over the ground field where you join the fifth root of b, then we'll see that you have a fairly easy root. Now a small note is that you, if you uh, want to have all the other roots of the polynomial, you can scale alpha, so this fifth root, with the fifth roots of unity, and then we'll find all the roots of this quintic factor. And then simply filling in to the equation of the elliptic curve, you can find the y coordinate of the p, uh, uh, the y coordinate of p prime as well. So we're done, apart from, from, from some 
very minor step in the sense that we found a p prime. However, if we translate this back to zero zero, we obtain an isomorphic form that is in Tate normal form again. Now it's just b prime instead of uh, b, and b prime is this very simple rational expression uh, in the fifth root of b with coefficients uh, no more than four. Now, as I said before, these division polynomials become sort of a bottleneck as well. The relation b minus c equals zero is very easy, but that's just for n equals five. As soon as you go to n equals 11, it's already not so easy anymore. The division polynomials also scale with n squared roughly, which means that the expressions become very large very quickly as well. Next, the Tate pairing of the point p with minus p this is also not simply going to be b, so this is expression also becomes more complicated. And if you then want to symbolically find a root of a very large polynomial, and then in, even more so in an extension field, algebraic software packages already start struggling for n equals to 13. Anything more, you'll need some different uh, approaches. And furthermore, these very simple uh, expressions uh, stop being the case after, let's say, n equals 9. I could still fit n equals 9 pretty easily on the screen in the formula, but that's about it. n equals 11, you would just need uh, to, find, to see the code for that. And we'll take a quick look at one of the applications for that, where it will be pretty obvious. We'll focus on the case where uh, q minus 1 is co-prime with n. Why is that? Well, first of all, it's, it's true in the seaside setting, so it's applicable. But also, every element has a unique nth root. It's easy to prove, and furthermore, this nth root is actually a simple exponentiation. So if we want to compute the nth root of this, we simply have to do an exponentiation, which is pretty easy, which you can do with roughly one and a half uh, log p multiplications with square and multiply. So this table gives us uh, the clock cycle count. This last column is the radical isogeny one, as I predicted earlier. If you look at the three isogeny, four up until nine isogenies, the clock cycles don't really expand too much. But then there's like a rather huge gap to the 11 isogenies and the 13 isogenies. And starting from 17 onwards, they're not really practical anymore not practical in the sense if you compare them to naively doing seaside. As you can see here, sampling an, n an n torsion point is a lot more expensive than finding the isogenous curve with filu. And finding the image of a point for pushing through points is even more negligible. However, if we're just looking at the overall picture, if you want to chain n isog uh, n to the power k isogenies, then radical isogenies are faster by an order of magnitude for the smallest primes, at least. Now, to be fair, as said before as well, there are other ways you can compute isogenies. You can do this with modular polynomials, exa for example, as well. If you would do this for a tree isogeny, this uh, method would simply boil down to finding a root of a degree tree polynomial over a finite field, which is a lot easier than sampling an end torsion point, but still an order of magnitude slower than the radical isogeny part. As for the second application, let's take a look at C-side. We'll be using a C the c sur 512 prime, which is um, based on C-side, but is simply a slightly different uh, setting where we can also use the two isogenies. But the same as before, we have 74 uh, alt primes, but we'll also be using uh, the prime 2 in this case. Now recall in C-side we had exponents ranging from minus 5 to 5, which meant we would do up to 5 isogenies of every small prime degree. But given that radical isogenies are so much faster, we found that it was a huge improvement if we did a lot of small isogenies. For the two isogenies, we compute up to 202 isogenies. For the three isogenies, up to 170 and so on, up until 13 isogenies. Of those, we could compute up to 29. The remainder, starting from the primes 17, 19, and so on, all up until the prime 389, 
we simply uh, compute them with the classical seaside uh, computation. Now note that uh, this is a very skewed box, and, as, and in particular we'll be using the four isogenies to compute the two isogenies. Next, after we've computed all the two isogenies, we'll use nine isogenies to compute the three isogenies. After that, the five isogenies, then the seven isogenies, then the eleven isogenies, then the thirteen isogenies, and only then we'll resort back to the seaside setting. Now, using radical isogenies like this, we get an overall speed up of about 19% for the CSER 512 parameter setting. Small remark here, though is that if you go to higher security levels, the speedup will uh, become less, for the simple reason that the small primes have less, have less weight in that setting. Now we'll give some concluding thoughts. So we found a very efficient method to compute long chains of small degrees isogenies, and if we use a very skew exponent box in Seaside, we can speed it up by about 19%. Now there's some interesting open problems that we can consider. First of all, as said before, the division polynomial sort of bottlenecks, starting from L equals 17 already. Can we find roots of the division polynomial efficiently? And if we can find roots of that, the formulas are not unique. As mentioned earlier, we can use P prime or 2 P prime. They generate the same kernel, which one gives us the most efficient expression. They are not all equal in terms of arithmetic complexity. The third point of to notice is that what's the impact of this on constant time implementations? For the people aware with constant time implementations of Seaside, they'll quickly realize that most of, if not all, of those rely on the fact that you first do an L1 isogeny, then an L2 isogeny, and so on up until LR, and then start over again with L1. And finally, what do we do with medium sized primes? This talk we talked about speeding up really small prime degree isogenies. And earlier this year, Bernstein, DeFeo, Ledu, and Smith have found uh, asymptotically very good formulas for high degree, large degree isogenies, starting from L about uh, 100. However, the medium sized prime, we still have nothing better than the classical value formulas, so that could be a point of interest for research as well.